Can you tell us how you first developed your interest in the law and ultimately in uh, pursuing a career as a judge? I was always very interested in the law, but I never really felt I could make my way through law school. So I would say I sort of put it off and put it off, and as the years went by, I had a, a very good friend who had been the judge in our area, and he was retiring, and he said to me, you'd be perfect for this position. And I thought, what a great opportunity. In Arizona, it's, it's an elected position. So I decided to go ahead and test my popularity in town, and I prevailed over, I think, six other candidates. I won the position, but as the years went by, I really felt that I needed, I really needed more education than I could simply get on my own. And this university was the perfect opportunity for that. I would imagine some of the people viewing this video might be surprised to learn that uh, you don't have to be an attorney to be a judge. Is that, is that common throughout, uh, throughout the states? It is. There are uh, 25 states in the United States that have what we call lay judges. A lay judge is a non-attorney judge, typically, but not always, elected. Uh, in many states, they are also appointed. In Arizona, we do have magistrates, which are limited jurisdiction judges, which are appointed by their relative cities, whereas a justice of the peace is a county judge, which is elected. Now, I actually am both. My city of Pine Top Lakeside has appointed me, and I'm elected in the county position. So I, I cover both courts. We're really combined. Um, our jurisdictions are slightly different, but that's how it works. And uh, it, it varies from state to state as the jurisdiction. But uh, there are a number of states that still, still hold on to the belief that you don't need to be an attorney to be a judge. As a justice court judge and magistrate, what kind of cases do you preside over? We have a variety of cases, starting out with predominantly traffic cases, everything from civil traffic violations, which are minor uh, violations, speed, all the way up to serious violations such as DUI, reckless driving, uh, drag racing. Um, we handle quite a few DUIs in my court, around 300 a year. Um, from there, we also do small claims lawsuits, we do, which are up to $3,500, justice court lawsuits up to $10,000. We handle evictions, I do several a week where we um, have to evict someone who hasn't paid their rent or for some other reason they haven't complied with their lease. Um, we also do uh, preliminary hearings on felonies, which can be very, very serious. Although a preliminary hearing is a very simple process of determining probable cause as to whether someone should be bound over to the superior court for further action in their case, I can see something, and I have seen cases all the way up to including first degree murder. So it can be very serious. Does that, does that stay with you, and, and how are you able to deal with that and, uh, and process those experiences? In the years I've been a judge, I think we've had two murder cases that I've had to see. One was horrific, um, and that one was very, very difficult. Um, I, I, in fact, uh, knew one of the victims not really well, not enough that I had to distance myself from the case, uh, but I knew who she was. and. Um, when I say she was a victim, she'd been stabbed um, while her boyfriend was murdered. And it was, it was horrific. Um, and of course, you've got the blogs in the newspapers. I had a, 150 rather ugly blogs that were in the newspaper. Um, I won't get into all the details, but it, it is. It's a good week-long uh, event trying to get it out of your mind, walk away from it. But you also have to sit back and say, I did everything right uh, as my part of that process. And you move on from there. I think the ones that are the hardest are some of the really serious domestic violence cases. Fortunately, I don't see very many real serious ones. I see the more minor ones. They're all serious. But um, I've had a couple of pedophile type cases that involved small children that were awful. Um, those ones stick with you more than anything. I have children, I have grandchildren, and you sit back and think, these things really do happen. They don't just happen on TV. They, they really do happen, and they're horrific. Um, and you do, you have to walk out of the courtroom and say, you know, why am I doing this? On the other hand, you say, I did my part of the process. It's going to go to the next step. Um, and you step back and say, hopefully it gets through the entire process properly, due process is served, and hopefully justice, depending on what happened. Uh, that's, that's all you can really do. What are some of the most uh, rewarding aspects of your work? I think the most rewarding thing is when you really feel like you've done justice for someone. 
whether that be a victim in a domestic violence case or in a civil lawsuit making the right decision on who should prevail in the case. And you know, being a non-attorney type of judge, or as we call it a lay judge, sometimes I probably have just a tad different perspective than probably the rigidity of an attorney judge. Conversely, what are some of the, uh, the greatest challenges you face as a judge on a day-to-day -day basis? On a day-to-day -day basis, I think the biggest challenge is probably managing the court. Depending on the size of your court, luckily for me, mine's fairly small, but you have to manage the court. You're a manager of staff. You are a manager of a budget. Uh, all these sorts of things. You have to deal with a board of supervisors, a city council. Uh, the court part of it in and of itself, I'd say, the greatest challenges are going to be working with uh, interesting and colorful attorneys. I think one of the biggest challenges we had in the judiciary was Proposition 103, which on, was on the ballot in 2005. It was an attempt to make our pro tem judges be non-attorneys. It, it's kind of a long political issue, but I was president of the association when that, that was proposed in the legislature, and we were in favor of it. It made no sense that you could be a full-time judge as a non-attorney, but your pro tem had to be an attorney. So we actually got the populace of the state of Arizona to pass that. Uh, that was very exciting in that we had that great success. That made a huge turnaround in our state with the way um, the Arizona Supreme Court became willing to work with the Arizona justices of the peace and magistrates before there was a great divide that brought us together and since then truly I, I feel our non-attorney judges have improved and we're working together to continue to improve while still keeping our system of lay judges. From your perspective what are some of the most essential personal or professional traits to being an effective judge? I think the most important thing to being an effective judge is your demeanor. Um, the, the Judge Judy type of people are completely unsuccessful. Um, you need to treat people the way you would expect to be treated. Now sometimes that may be harshly, but more often than not it's talking to someone just like I'm talking to you in a professional, calm manner, keeping them calm, keeping their nerves down because people come to court are very, very nervous, I don't care who they are. Um, and understanding and dealing with their problem, whatever that may be. Um, not to say that I'm a counselor, but the fact of the matter is it's very rare that I have to raise my voice because through my demeanor I can pe keep people calm, I can work to keep them calm, um, and try to get resolution to whatever it is they have before me.